Hey, I'm Eric Gershman, and I'm going to be talking about defeating the Chevy Stabilo track for track time fun. This is a bit about me. It's some of my contact info. Uh, you can find me at Eric Gershman on Twitter, eric at ericgershman.com on my email, and Hexus on Discord. So I, I started out in IT as a systems administrator, and uh, I quickly made my way into InfoSec. Um, during that time, I was hacking most of the most of uh, my career on the side or either for work, and I've been a pen tester for the last five years. I uh, I learned how to wrench in college, how to work on cars in college because I just couldn't afford to get my oil change. I had to do my oil changes myself, and uh, that quickly led to uh, changing my brakes. And then uh, finally, at one point, I got a '93 Miata. And I, edit, I, I changed my clutch on the Miata, and that was the, the largest pr work, uh, car project that I've ever done. Um, this photo here is from the Car Hacking Village uh, from DEF CON 24 in 2016. And it was the first time I went to the Car Hacking Village. I came up to uh, this car setup that was designed so that people could interact with it and find sensors. I looked inside, and everyone had picked over the interior got into all the sensors. And uh, so I decided to look under the bumper and was quickly stopped by the Car Hacking Village uh, staff um, because they didn't want me to start removing body panels to get to sensors. They just wanted to, us to really look at the interior. Uh, it, I feel like I've come a really long way since then. And I just wanted to say that I'm excited about contributing back to the Car Hacking Village after uh, experiencing it over the past uh, several DEF CONs. A quick disclaimer, um, the electronic stability control, uh, which is what uh, Stability Track is, each manufacturer uses their own trademark name for their electronic stability control, uh, reduces the likelihood of crashes by up to 43%, according to the IAHS. So disable Stability Track and the other safety systems in your car at your own risk. Uh, now, going into the reason why the, the starting of the title for this talk is Safety Third, uh, that being said, safety can't really be ranked. Safety Third is the idea that um, it should be jarring. Uh, most of the time we hear safety first, but uh, safety really is a mindset and it's, it's up to us. You can't always have safety first. There has to be a balance with risk. Uh, so for electronic stability control, it's commonly disabled for motorsport events and classes, even if it does save lives, because uh, in the end, you're responsible for your own uh, acceptable risk level. And you might be asking, like, why would you disable ESC and these other safety systems if they work so well on the road? And the best summary I could find was from uh, the Team O'Neill Rally School in New Hampshire. Uh, in their video, The Best Car Modification, they say that the easiest and best performance modification you can do is to disable traction control, ABS, and stability control, because those systems are um, designed for the street, and they'll work different when you're on the track, and they'll prevent you from really learning and becoming a better race car driver. Now, the flip side of that is even when racing, it, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it depends on what car you're driving. So for, uh, for a car like a, like a Tesla Model Y, um, the stability control on that car is supposed to be amazing. I've never driven one, but it's supposed to be spot on with the balancing performance and being able to keep traction and keep you safe. So there's a lot of cars out there, performance cars like Corvettes, uh, the Toyota Supra, where the traction control and the, and the stability control systems are tuned for the performance of those cars. And also the likelihood of you crashing if you turn those systems off increases a lot when compared to slower cars. With Team O'Neill, they're racing and teaching on sometimes base Ford Fiestas that when you lose traction you're, or, or you, 
you slip the wheels, you're not getting in as much trouble as if you were in a much faster car. And uh, that's really represented by this article from Road and Track about turning off stability control. They say the, the author says that the fact is that you can get the most cars to within two or three seconds of their best lap time with all of these systems turned on. Now, um, getting past just the safety aspects of this and, my, um, and the disclaimers, you might be asking, why am I trying to race? And, and why, uh, why am I getting, what started this talk? And it really is that I want to share my love of cars and racing with my son. Um, if, uh, if I really just wanted to race for myself, I would buy another 90s Miata that has none of these safety features and, uh, and add safety features like a rollover bar and, uh, and proper seats. Um, but really, I want to share this with my son. And um, I was really inspired by Jalopnik's Will It Baby uh, line of like, articles where they test different cars and come up with can you transport your little ones in it and still have fun and um so i test drove a large number of different cars and uh from the fiat 500 to the civic si a lot of cars that they recommended unfortunately the miata didn't make the cut but i did end up on a what i thought is like a compromise between hot hatches uh, when i did the test drives i, I realized that i either wanted a a uh, fast manual transmission car or a car that had a single speed and didn't have the lag of an automatic transmission. And uh, I came upon the Spark EV while researching electric cars and coming across this car and driver article about the 2014, 2013 to 2014 compliance cars. And they were super impressed by the Spark. It was the quickest car that they had, which was still close, slow when you look at like hot hatch uh, other hot hatches like the Fiat 500. Um, it was getting zero to 60 in, in mid seven, mid to high sevens. But uh, I decided to give this car a try. And um, when, I, uh, when I started driving it more and more, I realized that the traction control was gonna be a huge issue. So um, that's, the, that's the reason that, um, that's the mot really the motivation behind this talk. Uh, moving on to ESC itself, ESC is a system that detects when vehicle steering is going in an unintended direction, when the vehicle is going the wrong way compared to the direction that the, the driver wants to take it. And it compensates that understeer or oversteer by using single wheel braking in the ABS system. The ESC components, most electronic stability control systems include a electronic stability control module. In this case, the Chevy calls that the electronic brake control module. Um, sensors for the throttle, the pedal, a sensor for each wheel to detect wheel slip. Um, the anti-lock brake, anti brake system modulator, which would, is able to brake each of the four wheels. And then uh, a number of other sensors, including the torque angle sensor, yaw rate, and steering angle. Um, to sum this up, the, you can think of the electronic stability control as an add-on on top of ABS. And uh, it takes the sensors and the components that are required for ABS, and it adds a yaw sensor and a steering wheel angle sensor to detect the um, the intended direction and the direction the car is going. Now, knowing those components, um, one of the first steps I took was trying to pull the fuses. Uh, Team O'Neill has a lot of good videos on how to disable the different safety systems, and they recommend pulling the fuses first. So I went through my owner's manual, and I found that there were four different fuses. There was an ABS pump fuse, a valve fuse, an oil feeding fuse, and a fuse for the computer itself, the EBCM fuse. Out of all of these, I had the best results with the valve fuse. Um, the pump and oil fuse didn't come up with any results uh, other than a check engine light. And the EBCM fuse cut half the power to the EBCM, where 
the traction control system still seemed to be enabled, but uh, the throttle was still being cut, even though um, even though it wasn't doing the same braking as before. So I pulled the ABS valve fuse, and I immediately got a message for service stability track. So that means that the stability track system is disabled, and that worked out great. I was able to drive with uh, I was able to produce understeer. I was able to produce do skid, um, the car wasn't being cut off on power. And it worked pretty well. The brakes didn't seem like they were up to, uh, up to the previous performance with stability track enabled, um, but it worked well for the first ignition switch. When I turned the car off and turned it back on, I got a service brake assist message. And the power uh, brakes on the car actually cut off. Uh, so on that next ignition cycle, uh, I had no power brakes. It made braking really hard. So I quickly put the fuse back in. And uh, this turned out to be not a tenable solution because it messes with the power brakes, even, and I would have to pull, pull and put the fuse back in for each uh, ignition cycle. And also, it seemed to disable the electronic brake distribution that controls the brake bias. And that's the, the braking that the car does. Uh, the percentage of braking that it that it does between the front and rear wheels. So I moved on from there and I decided to go after the rest of the attack surface, starting with the yaw sensor. I uh, I I know I just bought the car, but I quickly pulled the interior. Uh, I pulled the seats out. I pulled the carpet out. And I started searching everywhere in the car for the yaw sensor, and I couldn't find it. Uh, at the same time, I was checking Chilton DIY and all data that had service manuals for this newer car, a uh, relatively newer car. And the only thing that the Chilton manual said was that uh, the yaw sensor would take an hour to be replaced. It didn't say where the yaw sensor was. It said how to calibrate it, but it didn't say where it was in the car. I checked on forums. I, uh, I learned a little bit more about the yaw sensor and how it works, that it should be in the center of mass. And I still couldn't find it inside the car. I even talked to the local parts dealer, and they said that it just doesn't exist. The yaw sensor part doesn't exist. So it must be included in another component, or they may have a simulator, and that could be why it's cutting in so much for people who drive the Spark EV. Um, so I had to move on from there. And I moved to the steering sensor. If I can maybe unplug the steering sensor, I might be able to disable just the stability track and not the ABS. Um, the EBCM, when I looked up, uh, or the steering angle sensor, um, when I tried to get to it, I couldn't get to it without pulling the steering wheel. And um, that involved, when I looked into the, uh, the specifics on it, $150 steering wheel puller from Chevy. And uh, I also, at that point, tried to go after the EBCM. And the, unfortunately, the EBCM is not accessible um, unless you go through the uh, radiator and take the radiator out. In the electric spark, uh, they mounted the EBCM under the uh, car battery and uh, behind the radiator. So it's really hard to get to. From there, I was inspired um, by an article by Rapid7 on building car hacking development workbench uh, to try to put together a workbench for a gas Spark EV, because there were no Spark EVs at the local pole parts near my house. Uh, finally, I found a Spark EV, a gas Spark EV, made it out to the junkyard, and immediately found the yaw sensor. That was super frustrating. I was excited, but it was, uh, it was right under where the noisemaker is, the pedestrian noisemaker is on the electric version of the car. And I was able to pull it out of the junkyard car in like five minutes. The uh, ABS module was super easy to pull um, for the, for the gas spark, because it was right where you would expect the brake modules to be, uh, easily accessible from the hood. Uh, so I pulled the ABS module, um, which included the EPCM, 
and I pulled the uh, yaw sensor and I tried pulling the rest of the wiring harness, but I quickly went over my estimated effort on pulling this and I ended up having to cut the wiring harness. Um, because of the time limits, I, uh, I wasn't able to create a full harness, but I was able to pull the EBCM module, which is on the lower half of this picture here, and hook it up to a bench power supply. Uh, after hooking it to the bench, though, it didn't power on correctly. The voltage was lower. Um, I found some pads. Uh, I have the EBCM module here. And I found some pads inside the module. I made some uh, wire cutoffs to like to access the diagnostic pads. But the uh, module itself, or, or the uh, when I hooked a multimeter up to it, it came into, uh, it, it produced a fraction of a uh, fault. So I knew something was wrong and that ended up being a dead end. So um, that's kind of where my research stops. At this point, if uh, I plan on racing in the next month, so I'm gonna try and go after a few other future attack paths. The first one is that I, I believe that I can decode the traction control shutoff message from the physical switch that's in the center console. Um, it, it hooks into the body control module, which is a separate module that controls auxiliary functions in the car and appears to only talk to the EDCM over CAM bus. So I'm gonna attempt to see if there's any messages that can further disable the track, stability track, or at least make it easier to disable. The second option is, uh, I, I believe I can get to the EBCM through the front driver's side wheel well. Uh, I, I've used this trick before when changing uh, oil and when trying to access components in, in cars. Sometimes the manufacturer says to do it one way and uh, you're able to go through the wheel well on, uh, on one side or the other to access something that, uh, that would normally take a much longer amount of time. And then finally, I'm going to build another non-EV stability track bench uh, in a car that doesn't require a steering wheel puller. I know the Chevy Cruze doesn't require that. Thankfully, my junkyard has about five Chevy Cruzes. Uh, so the local junkyard uh, seems like the best bet for that. And from there, I would be able to start reversing each of the components and observe them um, by hooking up a logic analyzer while the system is more functional. Um, going on to lessons learned, uh, while I had the interior out on the Spark, I, I thought, you know, I, I traced all of the modules in the interior, and one of them was OnStar, which I don't have a subscription for, and I don't need for racing. Like, I'm not going to be calling OnStar anytime soon, especially in an electric car that only gets 80 miles range. Um, so I decided to pull the OnStar module and immediately the check engine light came on. And I was like, okay, that, that's kind of expected. And I started driving. And um, the first time this happened, I made it onto one of the main roads uh, or closer roads near my house. And the propulsion for the power was cut. Uh, the, uh, it, it came up with this propulsion power is reduced message. And I was like, okay, this isn't too bad. I should be able to make it home fine. Um, I'm still getting like 14 kilowatts in this screenshot or in this picture of, uh, of power. You know, that's still a decent amount of acceleration. But then while I was driving, I hit 20 miles per hour and it drastically cut power. Um, it said speed limit set to 20 miles per hour on the, uh, on the message. And uh, then uh, the... I, I floored the, um, the accelerator and it only gave me like one or two kilowatts of, of energy for going to the motor. That meant that the miles per hour was only incrementing like once every two or three seconds. So it was a really scary moment, um, but I want to learn from it. And my plan is to figure out why the OnStar system do, does this when you unplug it. The only thing I can think of is um, for immobilizing in the event that somebody stole the car and tried to disable OnStar by unplugging it because it's easily accessible. Um, 
the other thing I want to see is could this be triggered by CAN bus messages or by by uh, flooding the CAN bus with the the OnStar me messages or the lack of an OnStar, like uh, basically silencing the OnStar messages. The other lesson was pretty unfortunate too, uh, and that was bring a scope to the inspection. Now the Chevy Spark uh, EV has a lot of plastic cladding. They tried to hide kind of that it's an electric vehicle. And uh, all this plastic cladding meant that during, when I went to buy the car and when I looked in the engine bay, I didn't see any problems. Everything seemed fine. Um, but when I actually pulled the plastic off to try to get to the EBCM, I came across this nest here and it's using like insulation from the car and a bunch of sticks. Uh, I discovered the nest and I was like, oh no, birds moved in. But then I started looking more through it and looking at the components of the car and I found mouse droppings. So I definitely recommend getting a, the like $25 scope from Harbor Freight or from online, a USB scope, and looking around in the engine bay when you're going to buy a used car. I haven't seen that recommendation in a lot of places for when inspecting a used car, but it would have saved me on this. Thankfully, it seems that the mice really didn't like the orange cables, the high voltage cables in the car, but it looks like I'm going to have to replace at least one or two ground straps before I take the car on a track. Um, and that's my talk. Uh, thank you, Car Hacking Village. I want to thank um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to speak, and I wanted to thank everyone that helped me with my research, my coworkers. I definitely want to thank my family, my wife especially, for dealing with a car that had like no interior. I still haven't put the the carpet back in the car, um, and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to my talk. These are uh, a bunch of links. That, um, that I wanted to include uh, for what I came across. Um, a lot of it is covered throughout the talk, but I just wanted to also mention the Chilton DIY and all data was really useful and an easy way for me to get access to the service data. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is I'm gonna be at DEF CON in person uh, and I'll be on the Discord. So if you have any questions and you're not able to ask in the Q&A, feel free to track me down, talk to me on Discord, or DM me on Twitter. Thanks, everyone.